Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, everyone. This is Doug Parsons, your host of America Adapts, the climate change podcast. On today's episode, we have M.R. O'Connor, author of the new book, Resurrection Science. Don't forget, consider subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and also visit the website at americadapts.org. I'd love to hear from you. All right, stick around and I hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to America Daps, the climate change podcast. This week, I have M.R. O'Connor on as my guest. She's an author of a book, Resurre- uh, Resurrection <laughs> Science. Hey there, Maura. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for inviting me. My, my pleasure. I, I want to give a little bit of background on you. And would you describe yourself as an investigative reporter or just a reporter? I used to describe myself as a roving uh, foreign correspondent. <laughs> okay. And the switch to science journalism happened relatively recently. But I mean, mostly I'm just a freelancer. <laughs> okay. Well, I had an investigative reporter on about a month ago who did this big story out of Florida. So you're my second reporter. You guys are always the most fun to talk to. So yeah, again, thanks for coming on. And again, when I was digging into your background, it's very intimidating. You, you've done reporting from war zones in uh, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, uh, you've gone to Haiti. And so it occurred to me, looking at your background, like you're one of those people that if uh, you know you encounter like at a cocktail party, there's two things: either you want to like saddle up next to you and just hear great stories, or you listen to what you're saying and you just hate your life because you haven't done anything with it. So <laughs> that's how intimidating your background is. On paper, on paper, but in person, I'm a five foot four uh, brunette with freckles, so it's uh, I, I'm quite sure that that intimidation doesn't cross over to real life. <laughs> Well, your your reputation is very intimidating, but it, I, I'm thrilled to have you on. But, you know, again, that could be its own podcast, but I want to jump into the book. And, you know, this podcast is about climate change. It's about adapting to climate change. And that's partly why I contacted you. I, I found your book. Your book isn't really about climate change, but climate change comes up a lot in the book. And so I want to talk about key points and the overall goal of your book, but then what it might mean for adapting to climate change. All right. So this is your first book, right? It is. Yeah, it's my first book. The germination of the book actually goes back to when I was in graduate school and uh, taking a really interesting class called Covering Ideas, which isn't sort of your typical journalism class. And I became really interested in the idea of how scientists are saving species by taking them out of their environments and bringing them into captivity for captive breeding, to try and maintain a population that's under threat in the wild. And this is a really interesting idea going back to the Bible, uh, Noah's Ark. And so I started writing about these frogs that I found at the Bronx Zoo, not far from where I was going to graduate school. And there was only two populations in the world of these frogs, and they were... um, one at the Bronx Zoo, one at the Toledo Zoo. And the place where they had evolved in the wild was the single waterfall in Tanzania that had been uh, turned into a hydroelectric uh, power plant. And I got really fascinated by uh, the story of these frogs, sort of the extinction crisis around them and trying to understand all the forces at work. And so I wrote the story up for that class, and then I went out abroad and did a lot of other different types of reporting. But I came back to it about four or five years later and realized that this was sort of an idea that extended beyond the frogs themselves and was really interesting to look at in terms of um, different species, different stories about how species facing extinction, how we try to save them and what those efforts say about environmentalism, ethics, and the future of the natural world uh, at a time of such, you know, enormous disruption. Well, so the topic is de-extinction. And so if people don't really know what that is, is that a species that's gone extinct, that there's now science underway to bring some of those species back. And, you know, there was a big event at National Geographic, this TED um, TED Talk. Uh, it was a whole day-long event. I actually got to go to it. You weren't actually there, but you pro- you've talked to a lot of the people that were part of that. Yeah. So de-extinction at the time when I was starting to think about how to organize and, you know, decide on the scope of this book struck me as such a fascinating topic because I saw it as sort of part of a spectrum 
of conservation strategies that are already taking place, albeit on the really extreme end of that spectrum. So when we're talking about intervening to do captive breeding or intervening to introduce you know, otherwise remote genetic populations to each other to increase diversity and adaptive potential, things like that. Um, we're talking about intervening to rescue a species faced with endangerment or extinction. And de-extinction is another type of intervention, although after a species has already gone extinct, and that extinction could be relatively recently. But of course, um, some scientists are even you know, thinking that this technology could allow the resurrection of species that went extinct thousands and thousands of years ago. So it felt like looking at a, you know, thinking about the topic of extinction today, um, we have to also consider these really, you know, wild technologies that even if it seems sort of tenuous and perhaps science fiction like, the, you know, these technologies are real and upon us, and uh, it, they may very well be employed more frequently in the future to, to deal with extinction crises. So I, I felt it was an important part of the conversation and also just the philosophical conversation around what we do to try and save species today. Well, I do want to read the little blurb you have at the front of the book, Conservation, De-Extinction, and the Precarious Future of Wild Things. And so, again, this book, just isn't about the extinction, you know, it's entitled Resurrected Science. And I'm just wondering, like, editorially, when did you make the decision to, to name the book? Because you cover so much ground in this. It's it's about conservation. It's about all these, I mean, like you said, technology, but it, it covers so much. And so what made you decide on that title? I think the idea, the, the sort of biblical themes had really fascinated me. So like I said, the idea of a Noah's Ark and the idea of conservation biologists today being the Noahs of a modern era of species endangerment and trying to put them onto, in some cases, literal arcs, like the frogs that I had first gotten interested in from Tanzania are in a biosecure room, you know, that I could only look in on from the outside. And so this idea of a sort of, you know, closed ecological system in the way that the, you know, Noah's Ark also was this closed, you know, boat floating in an ocean. I mean, these were very powerful themes to me and the idea of resurrection and conservation biologists also trying to resurrect species from endangerment crises was, I think, powerful to me as an organizing theme around the book. And the idea of wild things having a precarious f- future has to do with the fact that conservation has for so long at its core had this notion of protecting wilderness, that wilderness is a value that we should be protecting, but that when we intervene to save species, we are often having unintended consequences and influence over those species. We're, we're in a sense, changing their evolutionary trajectories and which really, I think, undermines that idea of wilderness and forces us to re-examine what it means to try and save something, whether we value wilderness, whether wilderness is something that's even, you know, real in an era of, you know, global anthropogenic climate change. Well, I'll be honest with you. I don't read a lot of philosophy or environmental philosophy, but to me, each of the chapters in this book could stand alone. You know, I, I don't know if you did that on purpose, but it's a great read. I recommend it. You do an amazing job bringing some of these characters in, and these are all real people dealing with real things. And so, I mean, anyway, I just, you brought the characters to life, and I thought that really made a lot of this more profound information that you're bringing into it. I mean, you, you would weave ethics of these decisions into the actual story. I mean, so the first chapter is about this, I and mean, correct me if I'm right, it's the Kinsanzi Spray Toad. Is that how you pronounce it? Um, Kihansi. Yeah, Kihansi Spray Toad. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you get done reading that first chapter, and you, I mean, you, you think it's just, all right, we're going to learn about this toad, but it's so much more. And I'm just curious, did you just kind of go off and I'm going to structure each chapter this way, that I'm going to include this kind of information, or th- did it lend itself to that almost immediately? Well, I've said that it was really interesting when I was trying to create the structure of the book and and think about case studies of species extinctions or endangered species on a spectrum. So I wanted to start from, you know, what's the most common form of intervention to try and save a species? And it's, I think, arguably captive breeding, which is what the Kihansi spray toad story is about. It's about going in and rescuing these toads by helicopter and bringing them to the United States and trying to breed them in captivity. 
And when I was trying to think of what other species then fit into that spectrum I was describing earlier, more and more extreme cases of intervention to try and save them and the people who make decisions about how to do that, you know, in some ways I, I could have picked almost any animal that fit into that, that spectrum. Like I, I had this sense that if I just put a few hundred species on a wall and like through a dart, I would hit a really interesting case study with really fascinating, committed scientists thinking, you know, creatively and ethically about how to save the species of their concern. There's just so many stories out there that honestly, it's not hard, I think, to come up with eight, which are the ones in the book. And And really, once you dig into the narrative around, you know, the science and and the people who are who are really committing themselves to dealing with these really complex problems of species conservation. I mean, it it really actually was not an impressive feat. It's just an unfortunate reality that today there's so many species that are facing these types of challenges. But, I mean, you did make a conscious decision that you are sort of reporting on the specific species. But again, you're weaving history into these chapters and you're talking about sort of these tough decisions and the ethics of doing some of these things and that in itself is you know it's a conscious decision to include that information and it was it just natural for you to do that or you just want to give that kind of backstory to to these decisions well i think it probably goes back to some of the themes of that course that i described early on this idea that journalism can be about covering ideas and not just events there's, I think that's a very powerful way of looking at journalism, narrative storytelling, and and looking at, okay, so this has happened, here are the people involved. Are there ideas and historical forces and philosophical paradigms that are also driving these stories and the decisions that people are making? And I think, you know, what I learned in that class and then became so excited about as a journalist is that indeed it sometimes seems that almost any story can be sort of looked at from a multidimensional way and to really, you can really go deeply into the sort of roots of the story. And so that's what I was, I was trying to do with the book. It's in each case of these species, it was possible to look at, okay, you know, what is the background for the political situation in Tanzania that drove the decision to create a hydroelectric dam there. And then that gets you into a conversation about poverty and electricity and how electricity and poverty are linked by policymakers. And, you know, then it's not just a story about species conservation, but you're, I think, illuminating a kind of bigger problem, which is that so many cases of species endangerment and extinction are about this conflict between our own human needs and enterprise and animals that we share the earth with. (laughs) And those are like very thorny, complicated issues. And as a journalist, they're also the most rewarding, I think, to try and untangle and wrap your head around. Well, so you started off with the toad. And so as you're deciding to to write this book, you're talking with scientists, you're talking, I guess, with colleagues. Was there anyone early on encouraging you to, you really do need to tell this story and maybe giving you suggestions of what kind of species to focus on? I mean, did yeah, you have that sort of inspiration from other folks? I mean, I love nature writing. You know, I certainly really love this genre of nature writing that where an author goes really deeply into looking at you know, an animal in the wild. And so I certainly was attracted to certain species, like the Florida panther story. I knew that there was this case of, you know, Florida panthers that in um, the early 1990s were severely inbred and there had been an effort to increase their genetic diversity by bringing panthers from Texas over to Florida and introducing them to the population there to try and save them. And then once I got into the backstory of who was involved with that effort and the politics around Florida Panther populations, you know, that just is clearly a really compelling story to try and tell. And it felt that way with most of the species. I think it just required some sleuthing in Google Scholar, <laughs> but uh, I wasn't necessarily being pointed in those directions by any sources early on in the process.
Well, who was the guy's name who was the real character? I think he used to hunt wolves, but then he helped with identifying panthers. What was it? He's like a cow. Uh, McBride. Uh, yeah, Roy McBride. Well, I mean, you did an amazing job turning him into this sort of legendary figure. I mean, so you talked to him. You got to know this guy, or at least your research got yeah, you. I talked to him, I think, probably, you know, against his will. And <laughs> <laughs> it took a lot of, uh, you know, I think it took at least a year of uh, kind of harassing him over voicemail and reaching out to everybody surrounding him to finally get a voicemail from him. And he, you know, he's not a guy who solicits attention for the work that he does, which is quite a challenge for a journalist. And there were moments where I felt sort of uncomfortable with trying to focus on him for my reporting because of his own discomfort. But I, the, the problem was that his his life was inextricably wound up in the Florida Panther story that it was really hard to talk about that, that case study without looking at um, his role in it. And so, yeah, eventually I did get to meet him. I gave him a copy of the chapter of the book. He was very gracious um, and he's quite an inspiring guy and he's, you know, still out there tracking Panthers every day. Uh, to produce these really controversial population surveys of Florida Panthers. And he's been involved in their story for four decades or more. Well, I think you were very generous in how you described and sort of built up. But again, I, he went from his history being a hunter to, you know, a conservationist. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, does he still hunt? So he, so two things. One is he would, um, he would really get mad at me if I, <laughs> Uh, didn't defend his good name and make sure that no one called him a conservationist. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so I don't. He would not put himself in that role, and I, I think that that's an indication of how political conservation is. And his life sort of exemplifies this really interesting policy shift in the United States. So yeah, like you said, early on in his life, he was a predator hunter for the United States government. He went after predators in Texas and um, other places in the Southwest hunting animals that threatened cattle ranchers and, and so on. Eventually, when the uh, Endangered Species Act was going to be implemented, the government realized that they were going to have to try and figure out how many of these animals were left in order to know what kind of protections they would need under the new law. Then they hired him to go in and find out whether any of these animals were left. And that's what happened with the Florida Panthers. No one was really sure that there were any Florida Panthers left down there. They sent Mr. McBride in to find out, and he indeed did find a very small population of the animals that was really severely inbred. And I'm forgetting the the number of animals that are alive today. It's a pretty politically contentious number, but I believe it's over. 200. I um, might want to fact check me on that. Well, I'm from Florida. And, you know, until relatively recently, I did not even know that they brought in the Texas population for, I mean, you know, maybe 15, 20 years. But when I heard that, it was, I guess it was a bit shocking to know that, that they did that. But I mean, I don't think I was against it, but uh, it was kind of late to understanding that even though I grew up in Florida. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a very interesting uh, issue. And science is sort of unhelpful in terms of thinking about it. So it's possible that, you know, hundreds of years ago, there was no such thing as a Florida panther and a Texas cougar, as they call them, that, or at least that the, the boundary between these animals was very porous. Um, there was crossbreeding. It's a controversial topic whether or not you can even say there are different subspecies of panthers within the United States or whether these are all originally one extant population. And so when they brought Texas cougars to Florida, you know, some people were extraordinarily upset about this. And there's even today people who will say that Florida panthers are this kind of hybrid super predator. But, you know, everybody I talked to who works with the animals, who monitors them, thought that that was wildly overstated. And in fact, these animals aren't necessarily genetically differentiated from each other and therefore, you know, who's to say that they that they aren't just isolated, but historically would have been breeding anyway. I don't think we can cover every chapter, but I do want to talk about some of the uh, the other species that, you know, 
you the pupfish, for example, when we ch- pre- briefly chatted before, you wanted to use that as an example of like, okay, climate change, a pupfish. These are, this was in New Mexico, right? This, That's right. And it, to be honest, it was it was very difficult to track all the things that were happening, the movement of population, and then the research that was being done in these different locations of these populations. These are the very isolated. And if you want to give a little bit more background on the species, but what was happening, they had these amazing opportunities to kind of study a fish that has been moved, and you know, it's the genetic diversity change because of this and it was you did a great job trying to connect all those dots but it was still like i can't believe this giant experiment yeah. happened out in the desert right yeah the science behind understanding this fish is very is very difficult and it was really kind of i felt when i was interviewing the scientists who themselves had been trying to understand how these fish came to be where they were and what it was that they indicated about rates of evolution, I felt like these guys were like detectives who had spent many, many years trying to understand it themselves and put the pieces together. And it was a real challenge to not only myself understand the science, but then try to write about it. I think the most important thing about these pupfish is that they're just remarkable animals and they live in this single or two places in in the desert in New Mexico. And one of them is a saltwater creek that is many times saltier than the ocean, yet they're a freshwater species. So that gives you this sense of how um, adaptive these little tiny fish are. What happened was at some point, fish were taken from one of the creeks and moved to two other locations, one of which was a freshwater creek and one of which was also a saltwater creek. And nobody really knew that this had happened when they did discover it and realized that there had been this translocation. They realized there had been this sort of perfect 30 year study that had been inadvertently designed where they could look and see, okay, within that 30 year period, what happened to the fish that were taken out of the saltwater creek and put into the freshwater creek and compare them. And what they found was that this uh, fish had one of the highest rates of evolution in a vertebrate species. And this is a really interesting uh, topic because scientists are now finding out that contrary to what we used to think about how evolution works and that it was in fact pretty slow, Evolution is constantly happening. The speed at which evolution occurs can change between species. And this really changes our understanding of what it means to intervene in a species, to move them into different environments, how things like climate change will affect them. And so that's why these little fish that, to be honest, I don't think outside of you know, a handful of academic journals have really ever been written before. <laughs> and they're not that special to look at either. So what do they look like? They're just little silver fish, like about two inches. I saw them in the creek itself. They move very fast. It was kind of hard to, you know, get a good glimpse of one. But they're on a military base. And so interestingly enough, in one of the buildings on that military base, there was a tank with some of them in there, and I could see a few of them. <laughs> wow. Cool. Yeah. I guess the that is an example of climate change, though. I guess there's this translocation going on, and then I guess the impacts of drought impacting populations. And so is that the sort of point you were trying to make with me earlier, though? That Yeah. Well, I think so if you think about evolution um, as operating at different speeds, what scientists have started getting interested in is could you sort of harness evolution to give species a leg up, so to speak, in dealing with changes to their environment? So could you somehow increase their adaptive potential? And like, for instance, one way you could do this is increasing genetic diversity. Another way that is a bit more extreme is through genetic engineering. And there's an example I briefly touch on in the book of American chestnuts, which were wiped out. I won't go into the details of that because I'm a little fuzzy on them. I haven't <laughs> looked at that case study That's in a right. while. That's right. But, you know, they're now trying to think, could we endow these chestnuts with genetic quirks that actually make them immune to the forces that drove them into extinction in the first place. And there's a a university on the East Coast that may, as soon as 2020, be able to introduce 
the American chestnut back onto the landscape because of this ability. So, you know, these are ways in which scientists are thinking, you know, could we help species get adaptive properties that will give them the ability to deal with changes that may be down the road. But this is hugely complicated. And I mean, I think, as you probably know, it's not always clear what those changes are going to be. You know, we can kind of delineate the different forces at work in climate change. But when you start thinking about the influence between environment and organism, if genes, resources and climate change, I mean, all of these things are, are linked, but we don't necessarily know how they all affect each other. And predicting that is, yeah, it's enormously complicated. Well, I want to skip a few chapters, and I hate to do that. Each chapter is incredibly interesting, but I, I want to talk a bit about Ben Novak and the passenger pigeon. And I actually saw him present at the National Geographic event, an uh, interesting guy. Maybe you could give a little bit of background. And just, I just want to say, you know, the passenger pigeon, your description of it in the book was just amazing. I was able to kind of visualize how big these populations used to be. And it, it, it's all the more depressing when you think about how big they were. But maybe give a little bit more background on that. Yeah, well, Ben Novak is, like you said, I mean, he's a really fascinating guy. He, most of the history of the passenger pigeon, I know from him and his own passion for this species and his total dedication to trying to recreate this species, which is just amazing. And uh, so, yeah, I think the one of the most interesting things about passenger pigeon is that this is a species that existed tens and tens of millions of these birds in the eastern part of the United States up until a 100 years ago. And that may seem like a long time that they haven't been around for long, but there are still trees on the American landscape that would have had passenger pigeons either feeding off of them or building nests in them or landing mm. on them. It's important, I think, to sort of keep things in perspective. And Ben, through his research at um, UC Santa Cruz, has they've discovered that this is a species that is likely 22 million years old. So when you think about how long this bird had been around for, and then the fact it's only been gone for 100 years, it starts really messing with your sort of perspective. And, you know, I think it sort of, for me, I came to the topic of the extinction and the idea that we could bring back already extinct animals with a great deal of skepticism. And through conversations with Ben Novak and others and sort of, yeah, by by reexamining my own sense of perspective and thinking about extinction, I became a bit more sympathetic to it. Although I still, you know, am not entirely convinced that the extinction is itself a solution to the broader species uh, crisis that we're facing at this moment in history. So you know, I, I I wrote a book about it, and I'm not sure that I, <laughs> I I totally think it's a great idea. That's for sure. Well, I think you were very fair to him, and just your description in, in the book. Just there's a lot of skepticism, I guess, from his colleagues about what he's doing. And you know, when I saw the presentation, there was other people presenting against what he's doing. And you know, my background, I, I was at the University of Georgia's Institute of Ecology, and so it, we bring these species in. How do they fit into the ecosystem? And I didn't get the sense from the book that he really cares so much about that. And again, the ecology of the species, from what they know, is that. Maybe there's a minimum population that you need before they even act like what a passenger pigeon should act like. And there's all these different right. factors. And so it definitely had like a Frankenstein vibe to what he's doing. I think um, I think that's fair. And I think that I also felt that in much of the conversation around the extinction, the ecological just the logistical aspect of it is sort of forgotten and a, a glossed over a little bit. So I felt particularly when we're talking about the extincting animals like woolly mammoths or something, there's, there's not a lot of attention being paid to like where these species would go 
how this effort addresses any of the problems such as climate change that, you know, other species are facing. Uh, Asian elephants, which are the species that they would are actually actively engineering to try and endow with woolly mammoth characteristics, are facing their own endangerment crises. And I don't think the extinction of a woolly mammoth addresses that in any way. So what I will say is that I noticed uh, just over the year that I was speaking with him that there was a, a kind of uh, growth and in interest in the questions that you were just raising. And so they are engaged with um, a number of studies to try and understand, you know, how many pigeons do you need to have a positive influence on on forests, you know, how do they interact with the forest, like really trying to understand the ecological niche and articulate an argument for why this isn't just a really cool experiment. And, you know, wouldn't it be neat to see a passenger pigeon in the zoo? But wait, what would it actually mean to reintroduce this species into the American landscape today? And what's the reason why we should do that? And so I, I think that's it least in the right direction. And I think there's a lot of awareness on their part that those are important questions that have to be answered scientifically and ethically in order for this to get any muster with their community and the broader public. Well, okay, that leads to my next question is, you know, you've done all this research and you, you see all these examples in you know, the woolly mammoth, there's passenger pigeon, but have you heard of anyone interested in the less, you know, because these are charismatic megafauna, but insects or things that might have more ecological value? Do, is anyone really seriously pursuing that kind of resurrection? Yeah, so there is, you know, the, the main sort of organization that's really promoting the extinction these days is Revive and Restore, which is led by Stuart Brand. And Stuart Brand is, that's the organization that is le at least is partially funding Ben Novak's research in the passenger pigeons. And they have a whole long list of, of candidates. And one of them, for instance, is the Heath hen, which I didn't write about in the book, but I know that there are, there's a growing conversation around could we bring back the species like the Heath hen and how would that affect you know, the ecosystem that they were from. I, there are um, species on that list that are less of these charismatic megafaunas. But that being said, I think certainly the media, you know, is definitely <laughs> more inclined to cover, you know, the idea we could bring back Tasmanian tigers and woolly mammoths and, you know, even the passenger pigeon, which I wouldn't call charismatic megafauna uh, has, no, no. has gotten a lot of attention from the media. Yeah, individually, I, I would not be impressed with the passenger pigeon, but just to see if yeah. one of those giant flocks, I, it's exactly. the, the way you described it, I think it'd almost be, you know, spiritual to kind of see that. That would be pretty amazing. Yeah, I don't know if the uh, airline industry is going to be <laughs> uh, the extinction of the passenger pigeon. And, uh, you know, that's a real concern. A lot of things have changed in 100 years in America, <laughs> you know. Would that work? I mean, that's a huge question. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. The the airline lobby, you know, lobbying against uh, passenger pigeons. That would be yeah. a, a new one. Well, I want to ask a, some qu climate change related questions. I mean, I, it's been coming up, but just your opinion, because you just went through this amazing journey of writing this book. But do you have an opinion if climate change could really be in the same category as like habitat destruction, invasive species and water pollution? And I mean, that came up in your book, but it's something different. But it's not. I mean, I'm just curious your thoughts on it's this new category and how it does influence resurrection science. Yeah. So, Doug, I'm going to pause here and say that I'm trying to think there's this fascinating study that just came out. Whereas, oh, God, I was like looking at it and I was like, oh, this is so interesting because it basically like ordered the threats and like climate change is like way down there. I mean, in terms of like what are the biggest it would be great if I could remember and I, I talk about that. You know, this is all good. We don't know the study. We, we'll, we'll try to identify that, but that's okay. There's a listing of it. and so. But your point is that for some people, climate change ranks really low. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that like habitat destruction for me was one of the most common – themes of the book and it for all the differences between the case studies of the different species and the fact that 
one is a, a whale in the North Atlantic and another is a panther living in the Fakahatchee Strand, you know, there's this common theme and that was a sort of diminishing habitat for these animals and, and what that means. And so, I, I mean, in a kind of unscientific way, my own thoughts when I had finished the book was that when we're talking about saving wild things or the idea of, of saving species who are facing these threats, we can't really just think that bringing them into captive breeding or even putting them into a protected wildlife reserve is sort of really saving a species in the fullest sense of the word. And that we sort of are dealing with in the last hundred years a sort of uh, what's the word like slippery or not slippery slope, but uh, what's the word when you move the goalposts? That. What's that? Move the goalposts. <laughs> That's an expression. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, that we've sort of been moving the goalposts and that we really have to, I think, sort of step back and and think about, yeah, what do we mean when we save an animal? Are we just talking about saving it in the sense that we'll be able to see it in a, you know, somewhat of a zoo environment into the future? Or are we thinking about saving it in terms of preserving all of the relationships it has within an entire ecology and even its ability to evolve in, in, in terms of those relationships and, and to go through a, a, the process of natural selection without constant intervention and influence from humans in its landscape. And so I certainly felt that after thinking about that, certainly climate change is a threat to habitat, but there's much more immediate threats which have to do with deforestation, development, pollution, you know, diminishing species ranges and things like that. To me, I've been working in adaptation for a while now, and I look at conservation, and you, and you talk about this in the book about the ethics of preserving these species and such. And you know, if you talk to a bunch of environmentalists, there's this sort of the intrinsic value of protecting things, and I, that doesn't really you know hold water for me, just because there's people out there just don't care about those things, and they never will. And we shouldn't pretend like they ever will. And so to me, with climate change, the threat, so if you pivot to the sort of the response, adaptation is like this new paradigm to try to deal with those old issues of habitat destruction. And it's just we need to protect and stop doing these things because of climate change. And, and it, it might be sort of naive, but it's like this opportunity to address old problems. And I think maybe it's a bit more of a compelling message to get people behind that. Like, okay, the future is uncertain. We need things as intact as much as we can to kind of get through this uncertainty, not because the panda is so wonderful. It's because we're going to be going through this roller coaster. Anyway, I'm kind of going on here. But to me, I look at adaptation as an opportunity to deal with some of those other issues. Well, I think what you're expressing is really important. And it sort of goes to a long running dispute over how we should be framing conservation. What is the argument that ethicists, conservationists, policymakers, anybody who, you know, has concern for these species involved, how do we convince the public that these species matter? And the ways in which people have uh, made those arguments is really, really diverse. And that there's the intrinsic value argument that you mentioned. There's the utilitarian argument. There's an economic argument. There's a lot of different arguments that have been put forth. I think that there's some real weaknesses in many of them. And I think going back to the Kehansi spray toad sort of exemplifies that. You know, you can say that a toad has an, a utilitarian value. And that may be true. In the case of the Kahansi spray toad, it definitely was not true. There was no other species that was going to go extinct if this one went extinct. There were no humans that were going to suffer as a result of this toad going extinct. The ecosystem itself was not going to go extinct if the frogs disappeared. So then it becomes harder to sort of deliver an argument, especially when you know, using this habitat for the generation of electricity was going to benefit so many human lives in Tanzania. So then you could say, well, the toad has this intrinsic value and therefore, you know, it's beyond utilitarian. So the, the value of the toad is in the fact that it exists, that evolution produced it. And that felt like a very 
I think, almost strangely cold-hearted argument when I actually went to Tanzania you know, and saw its habitat, saw the villages around the habitat, and could sort of, for myself and my own eyes, see how important it was for people to have access to electricity. And so these, these arguments aren't clear. They, they become very muddled. And I think that's a huge issue facing us right now is how to, how to begin to make these co- arguments coherently and really convincingly. Well, I have a few more questions for you, and you know, we kind of get through these quickly. But I just—it's more curious your thoughts, just based on what you describe in the book. But again, mm-hmm. regarding adaptation, so you're, you're familiar with the whole concept of translocation. You take a species and you move it somewhere else because it's not doing so well. And one we talked about in the Florida Keys is that you have the key deer, and they're thinking about because the keys will be flooded, they'll move it to the mainland, and what does that mean? And so I'm just curious, and you've, you've sort of expressed some of your opinion on should we really be doing some of this science? Is translocation any more, any less ethical than de-extinction science? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think while scientists are becoming more aware of that you can't just move things around without there being costs, I do think that it's important to make distinctions. I mean, I I think that there are scales of intervention and, and disruption and De-extinction, I mean, the level of manipulation that's happening there is, I think, a lot greater than moving one species or a a population of animals from one place to another. It's not that it's not also a, a manipulation, but I personally think that there are differences of degree. And some of those, I think, are, you know, are more comfortable than than others. Well, and, and a question related to the legal implications of bringing back a species, uh, depending, like let's say the Florida panther was extinct or something like that, and then that species started feeding on a, another endangered species, and you get into these sort of situations and this sort of, you know, did we want another threatened species to have to suffer because we brought back an already extinct species? And it seemed like it could quickly, you would create a, a I mean, maybe it wouldn't create that many legal issues, but they would eventually come up. And it just, does that right. drive your decision-making process that we've created a very clunky legal framework for endangered species and would extinct species like just blow that up? Right, right. Yeah. And I mean, I think there, there are some arguments that they might um, bring back like ecological balances that have been really disrupted. So there's a theory that perhaps the loss of passenger pigeons on the American landscape is connected to the rise in Lyme disease. And so things like that might be corrected. On the other hand, there are ways in which, you know, there might be huge disruptions. And you know, that's the case with woolly mammoth like it's very hard to imagine that that wouldn't be a huge disruption unless it was in a very controlled environment or you know carefully monitored and and then that sort of raises the whole idea of you know wildness like do we want to recreate animals in order to be museum objects so to speak for our own enjoyment or do you know animals have rights beyond their usefulness to us and you know does that need to be protected? But you're right that the legal questions have not yet even begun to be fully debated or decided. It may be that de-extincted animals, because they may have a, a kind of artificial standing, uh, won't be protected by the Endangered Species Act. I mean, that's a question that just hasn't been answered. I think that there's some conferences and papers and bioethicists turning their attention to that, those types of questions. And that's I think going to be a really important conversation, but it's, you know, it's hard to imagine Washington really having coherent attitudes towards this when the Endangered Species Act is already such a source of contention in so many places in the states and then on the world stage, who knows. I sort of want to put you on the spot. You've, you've already expressed your doubts about the extinction but I'm just curious, like, if you had to come up with just, a, you know, a couple recommendation or even one recommendation, like, okay, what's the way forward? I mean, do you ban this? Do you make it illegal because of X, Y, and Z reason? Or are there other ways to kind of move forward on this? You, you probably know as much as anyone that's not actual scientists doing this. I mean, I think as a journalist, 
you know, what I hope to see among those who are advocating for de-extinction and who are really involved in trying to harness the power of, you know, certain technologies today to do that is I, I think that there just has to be a very deep ethical questioning of the motivations as well as the practical effects. And so I think what I hope is that 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 will be clear that it will be that there will be an honest discussion about those and hopefully people won't be glossing over some of these really critical questions in order to you know because they have they have a, a preference and a, and I and I think an agenda and so yeah I'm I'm hoping that I see more of that and um I I point out in the book that most of the individuals that I talk to about the extinction are really brilliant, thoughtful people. And there's an argument that they make that I think is I'm quite sympathetic to about, you know, ecological justice and those things. But I think it's it's important also to be very transparent about the motivations, the, you know, profit motives, if there are any ethical, you know, agendas and, and so on and so forth. You end the book with a chapter about this um, woman, Christiane Ritter, and she lived in this remote area of Norway, and she endured this sort of amazing isolation. And maybe I'm more simple than I realize, but I did, you ended the book using this, and I just want – could you have explained why – I mean, you, you did sort of walk through at the very end, but I'm just curious, like maybe explain to the listeners, what were you trying to say with that? Yeah, well, so – Christian Ritter wrote an amazing book called A Woman in the Polar Night, and it's about this experience of spending a year in Spitsbergen, a little archipelago above the Arctic Circle. And the reason why I decided to write about it in the book is that Spitsbergen is also a place that the Norwegian government um, created several underground bunkers years back to house the world's agricultural diversity. So it's a it's a seed bank. And the reason they did this is it's a sort of apocalyptic insurance plan. They they want to have a place where should, you know, certain things happen, the nuclear war, you know, ir- irrevocable climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There will be a place where the product of, you know, human civilizations, agricultural genius will be safe. And I found it really interesting. Ritter's book is about sort of the beauty of the Arctic, about coming to terms with the insignificance of the human scale and the face of nature. And the idea that the same place that she lived has also become sort of a last hope, or maybe that's too strong, but at least a place where this sort of insurance policy against humanity's own hubris and missteps was just fascinating to me. And I thought it was a really great juxtaposition. And I looked at sort of what what climate change, um, what effects it's having on Spitsbergen. And yeah, just really trying to make sense of, of what's happening today and and what actions people are taking to try and save species and, and diversity, including things like the seed bank in Spitsbergen. Well, I thought it was a great way to end the book. It's just a, a very thoughtful way to end it. And I guess that's how I sort of want to wrap up our conversation. So the book's out, and this is your first book. And one of the first things people do is they go on Amazon and they start reading it. And there's all sorts of reviews on your book on Amazon. Have you gone through those? I mean, what has the reception been to the book? Yeah, no, it's been a great reception. I um, I haven't read the Amazon reviews, but they're all positive. I think I just... I get a little bit nervous. <laughs> so I, I haven't read them, but, but no, there's been a, a really positive reception to the ideas in the book, which I'm very grateful for. I also do a kind of bi-monthly newsletter where I gather sort of the different reading that I'm doing of books. Um, I love fiction and travel narratives and science books. And so I do a newsletter where I do little reviews of books that I'm reading. I put stories that I've written up. I, I link to interesting scientific discoveries of late. And so if people want to go to my website and are interested in getting a sort of, it's meant to be very pleasurable. It's not meant to be too demanding. <laughs> uh, they can also do that. It's mroconnor.info. <laughs> 
Well, in in my show notes, I'll have all sorts of links, and I'll, I'll follow up with you of any other additional resources you want me to share. And that, that's how I kind of get the word out on the podcast. So, yeah, I want to include that. And I am looking at your Amazon page, and the reviews are quite stellar, so you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, what, you. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be, yeah, it'd be depressing. you got like one five-star, and there's like 51 stars. and be like, I don't want to read that. So and are you, what are you working on now? I'm working on another book. Um, it's a little bit of a departure, but also a science book about navigation. And I am also currently a night science journalism fellow at uh, MIT this year. So I'm currently taking classes and trying to get educated <laughs> as, <laughs> as a research fellow here. But it's, yeah, it's great. So I, my next book will hopefully be out in early 2018. Great. Oh, gosh, I mean, you know, you're just digging into life. You really are just enjoying it and like doing all these interesting things. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, living without health insurance most of the time, but that's okay. What? So uh, that, was, that was my next question. There was n no movie rights or anything for the book or anything like that? Oh, no, I don't. Um I mean, I guess that's a possibility, but... Uh, well, I was half kidding about the movie stuff, but I, I this has been a fantastic conversation. I've learned a ton. Yeah, I just want to just tell folks it's a great read and this is not just about the extinction that's just one little part of this this is history of the environmental movement there's environmental ethics philosophies and it's just it's, it's a character study too of all these different people doing these things and so i mean just congratulations on this book uh, it, it it's it's it should be a marker for some people to read just going forward it's just not like this once shot i mean it's really a useful book so i just congratulations on that uh, thank you so much this was a great conversation it's really a pleasure to talk with you and yeah i'm i'm psyched to be a guest on the podcast well on that note thanks again and i i hope as you move forward and start writing on additional things science that adaptation will be in the back of your mind that uh it's a very specific area of climate change that's kind of growing but uh it needs more attention i think people lump everything together but it's it's its own unique sort of niche so on that note uh thanks everyone for listening in this is america adapts the climate change podcast Hey everyone, we're almost done here, but I wanted to bring your attention to the podcast itself. It's not easy dealing with all the audio issues associated with putting on a podcast. So for the last couple episodes, I have been working with Chris Mann from Podshaper. You probably have not heard many of the things that he has done to make this podcast sound great, and that's a good thing. He goes and he does all sorts of things that I don't even completely understand. And for the podcasters out there listening to this, Chris is available, and all you have to do is visit his website at podshaper.com. And his name again, is Chris Mann and it's podshaper.com. It has been a pleasure working with Chris, professional, very timely, and he's made my life a lot easier when it comes to editing and engineering these various podcasts. So keep that in mind. Thanks again. Hey everyone, that's it for this week's episode of America Daps, a climate change podcast. Thanks to Emma O'Connor for coming on the show and talking about her book, Resurrection Science. What a fascinating topic. You can find more information about Maura Connor on my website at americadaps.org. Also, please consider supporting the podcast. You can go to the website and there's a way to pay through PayPal and you can just do $5 a month. It's a way for me to continue to produce this quality product for you. But no matter what, these podcasts will be available for free on any number of podcast directories. Most people get it off iTunes. So also, please consider subscribing to the podcast on iTunes. And if you are so inspired, you're sitting there, you're holding your phone in your hand. And if you get this through iTunes, please consider writing a review Go in, hit that five stars, and even write something up. It would be greatly appreciated. Now, if you want to go and write a review and give me one star, give in to your apathy. Don't do that at all. Also, if you have ideas for guests, I hear from people all the time about ideas for guests, and it's fantastic, and they have come on. Please email me at americadaps at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Or if you have comments about the show, or if you just have resources you want to share, that I'm going to create a new part to the website where I'm going to just embed those kind of resources from all these great things that I'm learning for these guests that are coming on. Okay, that's it again for this week's episode. Until next week, this is America Daps, the climate change podcast. Yeah.